It's the video many of you have been asking for for some time now. Ever since I published my video about my solar panel system on my home earlier in the year and my experience with the installation and energy production I've been seeing, I've been asked for an update on how it's been going by a lot of people. Well, it's time. How much energy production have I been seeing? How much money have I spent versus how much I've saved? I'm gonna cover it all. But before we dive in, take a moment and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on future videos just like this one. I'm Matt Farrell, welcome to Undecided. I had my solar panels installed in September of 2018 and turned on at the beginning of October. It was a long and drawn out process, but pretty straightforward. You can check out my previous solar panel video for details around that experience. On that video, as well as my videos on energy storage, I've gotten a lot of comments about how solar isn't worth it because you're not getting energy on cloudy days, when it's snowing, or you can't live off grid, and it only works in certain locations. There's usually a nugget of truth in those comments, but they all miss the bigger picture for why solar works for so many people. For me specifically, I live near Boston, so I knew going in that my solar production during the winter months would be less than ideal. My home and the surrounding environment is also a little bit challenging with trees blocking the late afternoon and early evening sun. My goal has never been to be 100% on solar. For my specific situation, that's just not possible, but it might be for many others. My goal is to get as much energy as I can from renewable and sustainable resources, to reduce my carbon footprint as much as I can and do it in a financially responsible way that works for me. So have I been achieving that goal? <laughs> the jury's still out, but things look like they're on the right track. It was a little anticlimactic turning on my solar panels for the first time since it was a rainy day in October. I also knew that whatever I saw that month was only going to drop the following month since we were heading into winter. My system is managed by Enphase, which has an OK app and user experience for checking high-level data for day-to-day -day production. The way my system is set up, I don't see down-to-the-minute production numbers, but that hasn't bothered me too much because I also have the Sense Energy Monitor installed. I have a video on the Sense 2 if you'd like to see more on how that works and my experiences with it, but it's a pretty cool system that lets me see real-time data for my home energy use and solar production. Between the two, I have some great data for comparison alongside my electric bill. One of the common topics that's come up a lot in the comments is the cost of maintenance. It's still early days, but so far my cost has been zero. That's not to say there's been no upkeep to the system, but I haven't had to pay anything out of pocket to keep the system up and running. Over the winter, we had a number of good snowstorms that dumped a lot of snow on the roof. I found that the light snow typically didn't stick to the panels at all and melted away almost as fast as it landed on the panels. Heavier snow would accumulate just like a roof without panels though. If the sun came out in the next day or two, we'd often find many avalanches of snow as the panels cleared themselves off. Our roof was clear far sooner than our neighbors without panels. A few times I pulled out a roof rake to clear off the panels quickly to try to maximize our solar production, especially if the sun was shining again after the storm. I have a small house and I can reach about 90% of the panels from the ground with a roof rake. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes to clear everything off, so it wasn't too much of a chore, but shoveling away the snow that fell off is another story. <laughs> In the warmer months, you'll notice pollen and dust buildup if it hasn't rained in a while. If it gets really coated, you might start to see a minor hit to energy production efficiency, but I haven't. In my area, it's rained frequently enough that I haven't had to do any kind of manual cleaning. I did it once to see how difficult it would be, but it, all it took was a quick spray from the garden hose. To be more water efficient though, I bought an attachment for my roof rake that has a mop and squeegee head. I still haven't had to use it though. We did have two separate incidents where the solar panels stopped producing electricity, which was throwing errors in the Enphase system. My solar installer came out right away and determined that my AC disconnect switch was malfunctioning. The first time out, they switched everything off and on again to get it working. The second time out, they ended up replacing the faulty switch and everything has been working fine since. Looking at the energy production from the beginning of October, you can see a clear trend. My solar production starts at around 250 kilowatt hours for October, but quickly drops to a low of about 100 kilowatt hours in December. This low period continued through February, but more startling is when you look at the production numbers against the consumption numbers. We're typically using between 700 and 1000 kilowatt hours per month. And before anyone says anything in the comments, yes, that's high. 
but it's not out of line for the average home in the United States. Energy conservation is as important as clean energy production, but that's a separate video. <laughs> To say that I was excited to see how my production would take an upswing in the spring would be an understatement. I was like a kid eagerly awaiting Christmas morning for my Red Rider Carbon Action 200 shot range model air rifle. March is when everything took a sudden turn with production hitting around 670 kilowatt hours, which meant March covered two thirds of our energy use. Step into April and May and things stayed fairly consistent for production. Since April, we've been meeting or exceeding our energy use from our solar panels. For me, the highlight was when my wife, <laughs> she couldn't stop laughing when she opened the April electric bill and saw that we owed $10.94. Compare that to the previous year at $233.40. You can probably understand why she was laughing. Our June bill was the first one with a credit of $38.36 on our account, which most likely means we won't have to pay a bill at all in July either. If you step back, you'll see a sine wave pattern emerging for our solar production, which means I can provide a pretty good estimate for what the rest of the summer and early fall will look like. Depending on how July through October plays out, it's looking like we may come in around the low 6,000 kilowatt hour range for the year. The estimate we received from our installer was 6,615 kilowatt hours for the first year, so I think we're going to fall a little shy of that estimate. If that turns out to be the case, it's going to be disappointing, yes but not a showstopper. And it's also only half the story. For the other half of the story, we need to look at the money. Here's a look at our electric bills kilowatt hours over time, all the way through 2018 and up until June. Across the board, you can see that we've done better, especially once you hit March. For the actual electric bill price, it looks very similar. The delta between what we've paid in the past spring and summer versus what we're paying now is substantial. Just in electricity costs, we've seen $929 in savings from the previous year, which accounts for a 48% drop from before solar panels. But if you want an apples to apples price, it's easy to calculate the price per kilowatt hour the panels have been generating. Just take the cost per kilowatt hour and multiply that with the kilowatt hours the system has been producing. Since we're on full net metering, we're getting full credit for all of the solar power we're using and putting back into the grid. That's $873 so far. When you add in the SREC program, which are credits paid out for how much electricity you put back into the grid, that adds another $1,136 on top of that. We have a 10-year solar loan that has a minimum payment for the first year of $148 a month. But we didn't start paying that until December. If we retroactively roll those payments back to October and November, you'd be looking at $1,332 in loan payments for the same period. Now that's a lot of numbers I just threw at you. So let's break those down at a high level. We end up positive by $677 so far. If we didn't have SRECs, we'd be negative $459. Would that mean it's not worth it? For me, no. Paying the minimum on the solar loan will pay it off in 10 years, but we're not doing that. We've actually been overpaying the loan already to get it paid off earlier than 10 years. That will reduce the loan interest we're having to pay and help the solar panels hit break even sooner. The solar panels are warranted for 25 years, but can be expected to work well beyond that. So again, even without SRECs, the system would hit break even and turn a little profit before its end of life. And as much as people like to hold up incentive programs and subsidies as to why solar panels don't work, we do have them. Once you put those numbers back into play, you can see that we're actually getting money back from our system today, even with our minimum loan payment. That means our out-of-pocket costs for the system are close to a wash for the loan payment period right now. Our loan payment and electric bill are balanced out with our solar energy production and SREC credits across the past nine months, and that should hold true for the next year. So what about the system turning a profit? What's the payback period? Like I've said before, it's still a little early to tell for sure because I'd like to have at least one full year of data before that. However, filling in the blanks for those few months we're missing, here's how it's looking right now. Our system cost $29,609 for a 9.49 kilowatt system made up of 26 LG 365 watt panels. In my previous video, I had said that we were gonna be getting a $9,883 tax credit, but that was a typo. It should have been $8,883. Once we got that tax credit back in our tax refund, we immediately applied it back to the solar panel loan, which knocks the final amount we're paying off to $20,726. 
Depending on the rate we pay off the loan, it could be close to $6,800 in interest over 10 years, which is why we're paying it off faster to reduce that amount. For the sake of the numbers here, I'll keep that interest in here for the total of $27,526 on the loan. We're getting $126.22 a month in SREC credits for 10 years. So we'll be seeing $15,146 from that. That leaves us on the hook for $12,380 out of pocket. But then you have to look at the money we're saving from our electric bill. We were spending around $2,600 a year on electricity, but we'll most likely be spending about $1,100. That's a savings of $1,500 in the first year. If we assume that the electricity prices won't increase, <laughs> they will, and my panels will produce the same exact amount of energy in those 10 years, they won't, then I'd be looking at about $15,000 in savings over the first 10 years. That would mean that the solar panels will have reached their payback period in about eight years, which is right in the ballpark of what we calculated before having them installed. Yes, there is variability in there because of the cost of electricity, reduced panel efficiency over time, but I'm putting that to the side for simplicity. In reality, I don't think it's gonna change that prediction much at all. In the US, electricity prices have risen by 15% over the past 10 years, which is about two cents per kilowatt hour per year but that varies depending on the region. In my area specifically, prices have increased 10% in the past 10 years. And under my panel warranty, they're guaranteed to produce at least 88.4% of their original efficiency. If anything, I'm gonna see the cash amount saved in electricity increase each year because of how quickly the electricity prices are rising. Not a drop because of a minor decrease in panel efficiency. Again, depending on the cost of electricity and without the SREC credits, I'd be looking at a payback period closer to 13 years, not including the interest. And if I also didn't have the tax credit, I'd be looking at closer to 18 years. No matter how I slice the numbers, I always came out with my specific solar panel installation earning its money back before the system's end of life. So have I achieved my goal of getting as much energy as I can from renewable and sustainable resources? to reduce my carbon footprint as much as I can and do it in a financially responsible way that works for me? Yes, <laughs> I have. Financially right now, we're in the same month to month position as we were before solar panels, but we're getting the benefit of reducing our dependence on fossil fuels for our energy use. In another eight years or so, we should have the system completely paid off and turning a tidy little profit for us going forward. So far, so good but I'll be keeping a close eye on my system and how it's holding up to those predictions. I don't anticipate any maintenance costs to throw that off by too much, but time will tell. Now, if you're interested in going solar, I strongly recommend checking out Energy Sage for research and articles, which is a completely free service. They have great write-ups and reviews of different solar panels, inverters, and solar tech that can be useful no matter where you live. But if you live in the US and are interested in going solar, you can get quotes from installers by using my Energy Sage portal. You can plug in your information and request quotes from solar installers, which will get funneled into your Energy Sage account, and you don't have to worry about getting flooded with phone calls. I've used it myself and can vouch for how well it helped me through the process. So what's your experience? Jump into the comments and let me know how your solar panel system has been performing for you. Is it meeting expectations? And if you don't have panels but want to get them, what's been holding you back? If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends because it really does help the channel. There are some other ways that you can support the channel too. Check out my SFSF shop for some cool Tesla, SpaceX, science, and undecided shirts. There's also other links in the description for some great Tesla accessories and discounts. And as always, an extra big thank you to all of my Patreon supporters. Your support is really helping to make these videos possible. If you're interested in early access to videos and behind the scenes posts, check out my Patreon page for additional details. And if you haven't already, consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell to get alerts when I post new videos. And as always, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.